Well, welcome, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be hosting a distinguished speaker today, Larry Pape, who will talk to us in a moment about America's energy future. Um, before I do that, though, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Steve Kowaler. I'm president of the Iowa State University chapter of Sigma Psi, the research society. Uh, we sponsor three lectures during the year, uh, actually four lectures during the year, two from distinguished speakers through the Sigma Psi National Lecturers Program, of which tonight is one, and two by local scientists uh, and engineers and others. Tonight's program is our spring national lecture, uh, and our speaker today is, is Larry Pape. If you're here, you kind of know about him, so I'm not sure what more to say, uh, except that he is one of the nation's experts on power production in the U.S. and has been for a very long time. What you can't get from the, uh, the literature that's been distributed uh, is that Larry is a New Jersey native and a fellow New York Yankee fan uh, who was banished to the West Coast a long time ago uh, and in the process uh, went through something that's so inhuman as he was describing to us at dinner that I, I, I almost don't want to mention it. But he survived an interview with Admiral Rickover for one of his first jobs. And if you have questions about that, I'm sure he'd be happy to scare you with those stories as well, as he did with us at dinner tonight. Uh, he spent the day on campus visiting with people uh, in the biorenewables field in the engineering college, uh, and is here tonight to talk to us about a report that's recently been released on America's energy future. So uh, without, well, before I do that, I need to thank a few people. I need to thank, first of all, Steve Martin from Mechanical Engineering, who uh, organized this. Steve, unfortunately, couldn't make it. He had travel that, that came up at the last minute. Uh, and the, my fellow members on the executive committee of Sigma Psi. Okay, now, without any further ado, okay. it's a pleasure to introduce Larry Peck. Thank you, Steve. All right, let me know. Can you hear me? I've got a microphone on, and I think it's on now. I want to thank the Sigma Xi Society for inviting me here to uh, give this talk. It's an area I've been involved with, as uh, Steve mentioned, for quite a few years. My first involvement with, well, first of all, did you recognize the two songs that were played during the warm-up, so to speak? The key line from the first one is, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. And the key line from the second one was, let the sun shine in. And I think they're particularly appropriate for tonight's lecture to talk about where renewable energy sits in terms of America's energy future. I'd like to thank the, the society, as I started to mention, for inviting me here. This is a, my involvement with renewables started in 1970, so simple mathematical uh, subtraction would say that I've been involved with renewables for 40 years. I signed the first contract for power purchase from wind turbines in 1981, which is 30, essentially 30 years ago. So I've been involved with, uh, with these technologies and their development for quite a few years. Steve mentioned about... That may have been my cell phone. I'll get, get it out. Sorry about that, folks. But that was, a, that was actually a test to make sure the emergency broadcast system is operating. <laughs> um, Steve mentioned a report, but let me tell you that there were actually four reports that were done. Uh, the first one being the major report, which is called America's Energy Future, the cover of which is on the left. There were three panel reports, one on energy efficiency, one on alternate fuels, and one on renewable energy. And I had the, uh, uh, the honor and pleasure of chairing the re Electricity from Renewable Resources report. So I'm going to re re t talk to you tonight about both of these. My major emphasis is going to be on the renewables one. But to set the scene a little bit, I'd like to talk a little bit about America's energy future. Uh, this chart talks about the major forces shaping the US energy situation. I don't think there's anything up here that you haven't thought about and heard. What's important in today's environment is that all of these things are coming together simultaneously. Over the last 40 years, there have been lots and lots and lots of discussions and talks about needing to do something because of energy security. 
needing to do something because of the high price of oil, needing to do something because of air pollution and environmental concerns. But what we've seen in the last couple of years of all of these have come together in a nexus which uh, makes it rather imperative that something be done in terms of America's energy future from an energy security, energy cost, energy availability, and environmental concerns. Now, an interesting fact is we're not alone in this, although the United States has historically been the big energy user. The important point on this particular slide is to show you that the consumption of energy in China has been rising dramatically. And only a couple of years ago, we said the crossover point between the US and um, China in terms of equality, in terms of energy use, would occur in 2027. Three years later, the projection is to move that up to 2014 because of the growth in energy consumption in China. So we're sitting essentially at a par with China at this point in time, and other th what were formerly called third world nations or developing countries, particularly India, is in the next big sleeping giant, so to speak, that's going to have tremendous growth in terms of energy. China's building uh, essentially one to two new coal plants per week, even as we speak. They've got a lot of new nuclear units online, but they're building a lot of coal. Now, recently, they've talked about increasing their commitment to renewable energy, but they're confronted with a problem very similar to the United States, that is, where does the energy resource exist? Where do the load centers exist? And the point, in fact, in China, those are thousands of miles apart. More on this later. Just to give you a feeling, this is something you've all experienced and lived through. This is a chart, and the left side of the chart is an annual uh, uh, set of figures. But then when you get to uh, 1908, it goes to a monthly set to the right of the dotted vertical line. And it shows you the American appetite for light vehicles, swinging from automobiles to tr light trucks. Trucks, of course, had lower gasoline mileage numbers. And look what happened in terms of uh, the choice of vehicle type as the price of gasoline went up with the oil rise in oil prices in 19, 2008. There was a decided switch on the part of Americans, but with the price of oil dropping once again, we seem to have returned to our old appetite for light, light trucks rather than um, auto, uh, sedan-type automobiles. Now, in terms of net energy on a per capita basis, you can see that uh, electricity has grown at the expense of other forms of energy. But it looks as though things are in pretty good shape because we see the beginning of a drop off in total energy and in electricity starting in the not too distant past. But look at the subtitle on this chart. It says, Energy Efficiency and Economic Structural Change. The second part of that is the key part, economic structural change. As manufacturing jobs have left the United States for other parts of the world, our energy consumption has dropped dramatically. And that is not due to energy efficiency alone. It's due to the fact that we've offshored all sorts of jobs, especially in the manufacturing uh, setting. And this, of course, are, these types of jobs involve heavy uh, usage of, of energy, particularly electricity, but also coal. So we're outsourcing more and more manufacturing. We're also outsourcing the use of energy and the pollution that goes along with it. And the country that's do, doing, picking up the slack the most of all of these is China. Uh, we import more goods from China than any other country, and it's basically those things which have been outsourced from the United States. Let me tell you a little bit about the structure of America's energy future. As you can see on the left, the Committee on America's Energy Future in blue, you'll see the different types of technologies we took a look at. Um, next to that, on the right hand, in the center, you will see the three panels I mentioned before in terms of energy efficiency, renewables, and alternate transportation fuels and the types of studies that were done. There were actually, I should say, there were five studies because there was a summit held in early 2008, and that's in the uh, 
dark yellow in the bottom, as well as the three panel reports and the main committee report. As you can see from the <coughs> factoids on the left, a lot of people were involved in this in terms of panel and committee members, consultants, staff, workshop participants, reviewers, reports, etc. So this was a large effort, probably in the order of $3 million, and there's a lot of free time in terms of the committee members. They're all unpaid volunteers, so this is an extremely large effort that was carried out. What was the major conclusion? The major conclusion, as you can see at the top, is the talk about, is the point about needing to uh, make a sustained effort to transform the manner in which the U.S. produces and consumes energy. By sustained ed effort, we're really talking about the political will not being changed on a sort of a whim basis on a day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year basis, but the fa fact that we need to make commitments over an extended period of time. And it would actually require that we transform the energy sector. I've mentioned to a couple of people today in the conversations that I, I've had that we really need to th begin to think of the you know, power sector in terms of a 21st century paradigm and not the 20th century paradigm. We're still operating with a 20th century paradigm in terms of power development and power uh, flows. And I'll get into this a little bit more later when I talk about the transmission side of things. The key factors, I think the most important factor that has a near-term benefit is, the, we call it the low-hanging fruit, deals with energy efficiency. The biggest problem in implementing energy efficiency improvements is the fact that uh, it's up to individual consumers, by and large, to make the commitment to do energy efficiency improvements. And when you leave it up to an individual, then there are competing uh, demands for the capital that the, an individual homeowner might have. Do I buy a new color television set or do I put in uh, fluorescent lighting? Do I do A or do I do B? And so it's uh, subjective decision making to a large extent on the part of individuals. On the commercial and industrial sector, it's driven by cost and cost benefits that would accrue to the business. So it's easier to do energy efficiency improvements in the commercial and industrial sectors than it is on the residential sector. The second major conclusion deals with the supply side of the equation. I will not stand here and say that any one energy source can solve our problems going forward. We need a mix. I can tell you as from having operated a large utility company that if you don't have a mix, you become dependent or overly dependent on a particular energy source, whether it be hydro or oil or natural gas or coal or nuclear or what have you. If you become overly dependent, there'll be a shortage or a problem of some nature which will sh cause you to come up short in your ability to supply the load that's out there. So a mix is absolutely important. Some of the resources that are out there, like coal and nuclear, tend to be what we call base load units, units that, because of their high capital costs and low operating costs, you want to have run and operate as long as they are up and able to run and have capacity factors of 90, 95 percent. You have other units which are more uh, costly from a fuels point of view, gas-fired combustion, and you use those on what we call intermediate load to fill in the peaks as they come along. And then you have the intermittent renewables, and I'll include hydro, although hydro, people think, is not intermittent. Yeah, hydro is. It's a seasonal resource, and if we don't manage it properly, <clears throat> you can draw down the reservoirs and have a shortage of hydroelectricity. Wind and solar tend to be on a diurnal basis. That is, the wind comes and goes on a daily basis, as we know the sun does. Or at least we hope the sun does rise every morning. So we have to manage things differently, and that's what I'm talking about when I talk about a 21st century paradigm, is to look at each of the resources that we will be using out there and figure out what's the best way from a societal point of view to utilize each of these resources, because some of them have high fuel costs, some of them have high capital costs, some of them have high availability, some have intermittent availability, and putting all of this together is uh, uh, the clue or the key 
to meet, meeting our needs in the 21st century. And transportation, uh, we need to get off of the consumption of oil. 60% of all the oil we consume annually comes from abroad. So it's imported oil, and that is costly. It's subject to security concerns. It's sub subject to price run-ups at the whim of the OPEC nations. The recurring theme is major challenges are coal and cars. Coal, because coal represents a little over 50% of the electric power generation capability in this country, and it's the highest carbon emitter. So we've got to do something to fix the coal problem. And cars, because cars are the largest consumer of oil, or an oil-derived product. And we've got to fix that problem. I mentioned before that energy efficiency represents uh, the lowest hanging fruit sitting out there. And the potential is huge. And it's, uh, when we did this study, America's Energy Future, we divided the future up into three buckets. We looked at what could be done between now and 2020 to drive down uh, energy usage and also bring in alternatives. And we looked at a second bucket from 2020 to 2035. And there the question was, what can you do now from an R&D perspective which will give you technologies that are usable in the 2020 to 2035 timeframe? Then the third bucket was post-2035 out to, say, 2050. And that bucket is much further in the future and much more obscure, but what really long-term uh, R&D might be done which could be transformational in the very way in which we do business, and such things as uh, uh, biologic photovoltaic systems, for example, things of that sort. So we, we looked at three time buckets. I'd say 70% of the time we spent was on bucket one. What can be done now to, uh, to change our energy usage patterns between now and 2020? About 20% 20 on the second bucket and 10% on the last bucket. <coughs> On the supply options, it's clear that uh, what, what I'll show you on the renewables panel report is renewables are deployable today. There are no technological barriers to the introduction of select uh, renewable technologies. But the two big baseload technologies, coal and nuclear, do have some definite needs to be, become viable alternatives for the future. Coal, if you believe in terms of carbon capture and sequestration, needs adequate demonstration of the carbon capture and sequestration technology between now and 2020 to be viable post-2020. And there is a lot of discussion going on in Washington about putting out six to 10 uh, carbon capture and sequestration demonstrations so that coal can look extremely clean in the post-2020 world. The same thing is true of nuclear. We talk about a third generation of nuclear plants coming online. And last, was it just last week, I think, uh, President Obama announced that uh, the first loan guarantee for a third generation nuclear plant was going to be given to the Southern Company in, uh, to put a new nuclear unit in Georgia. This is of vital importance to keep the nuclear option alive. Now, there are people who are pro and anti-nuclear. I find it difficult to, to say that we can have a clear path to the future if we don't do both of these things, both coal and nuclear. Nuclear today represents 20% of the electric power generation in this country. We've not added a nuclear unit in you know, close to 20 years, well, 20 years now. And yet the fraction of nuclear-produced electricity has remained 20% because of two reasons. One, the units are operating with a higher capacity factor. They're well over 90% now. And secondly, there have been upgrades to the existing nuclear fleet of plants that are out there. So they've maintained a 20% level, even though the total energy electric power consumption has gone up because of improvements in the nuclear fleet. So the, the technology has matured, and it's uh, ready for further deployment. The units, the types of nuclear plants being offered today are not like the ones 
really that have been built back in the 70s and 80s. They have a, a more passive design in terms of safety, uh, fewer uh, what I'll call Rube Goldberg safety systems and more straightforward because it's been included in the design right from the start. So nuclear and coal with carbon capture and sequestration are going to be important. I mentioned the 21st, here's another aspect of the 21st century paradigm. The transmission and distribution systems. Transmission is how I get power from the basic uh, power producing facility wherever it's located to the load center. The load centers are the major cities and uh, industrial areas of this country. The distribution system is the lower voltage, how I spread it out to residences, to commercial uh, establishments and to factories and businesses in the load centers. Many components out there today in our transmission and distribution system are over 100 years old. Their original equipment that was installed at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. There was a major infusion in the 50s and 60s uh, to recover from what had been the depression of the 30s and uh, the wartime uh, efforts in the 40s so that there was a modernization and an upgrade and a huge increase in the consumption of electricity. So there are components out there in the transmission and distribution system that are 100 years old, 50 years old, two weeks old. And all of these have to work well one with another. There are modern technologies which are out there which need to be introduced into the transmission and distribution system. If I were to compare it to telephones, telephones went solid state about 50 years ago with the first solid state uh, circuits that were being installed. We are now getting solid state equipment that is available to do switching for electric power systems. So we're only 50 years behind telephony, but it'll allow you to uh, operate more intelligently the transmission and distribution systems that are out there. Key to this also will be two-way communications between the individual user of electricity and the grid itself. So something that's called smart meters or AMI, automatic meter initiative, will be important because we will need to communicate two ways, send out pricing signals to the consumer to turn on or turn off particular pieces of equipment because the price of electricity has gone up or down or what have you. They'll also be able to tell the operator of the system when a problem has occurred on, uh, they'll see outages in terms of individual meters or groups of meters in a neighborhood and know that an outage has occurred before you even get a chance to pick up the phone and call the, the power company. But it doesn't come without a price. If you add up the numbers here for modernization and upgrade, you're going to find that it's about a trillion dollars if you add all four of those numbers up. So there's a huge cost out there to do the modernization. But if we don't do the modernization, we'll continue to operate a system which is, to a large extent, antiquated. This is a good example of, you know, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. The transmission system is only as, str as strong as the weakest interconnection. And the interconnections need to be upgraded. Now, on to the renewables report. This is something I think I know a little bit more about, too. Okay, what about renewables? Well, about 10% of all the power generated in the United States comes from renewables. The vast majority of that comes from hydroelectricity, and it varies from 6 to 7%, depending upon whether you have a good water year or not. About 2% is biomass, and that's to a large extent based upon the pulp and paper industry. 1% from other, which includes wind to a large extent, some geothermal, some solar. But the growth rates for both wind and, and uh, solar energy have been rather fantastic. But large growth rates are perhaps indicative of the fact that you have a small number to start with, so a 20 or 30% uh, compounded growth rate is easy to do when it's a small number. And we'll look at how you, how you move forward in a scenario point of view to get the 20% wind in a little bit. You may have seen wind resource maps. Uh, this is a wind resource map. It shows you that the uh, 
The best winds in the contiguous 48 states tend to be in the Rocky Mountain Great Plains area. Uh, there are localized wind resources on coasts. The Aleutian Islands in Alaska are a tremendous wind resource, but I'm, unfortunately there's not much load up there, so you, you, can, you harness the wind. I'm not sure what you do with it. You charge a lot of batteries, I guess. <laughs> Hawaii's got some pretty good wind resources, too. This is a map of the solar energy uh, around the United States. Here there is a geographic uh, predominance to the American Southwest, and that's to be expected, I guess, simply because of the weather. Now, you've had some wonderful days these last couple of days. I've been here. There hasn't been a cloud in the sky. Great solar days. Unfortunately, the temperature wasn't what I had expected. <laughs> now, how much wind and solar can we harness? Now, here's some... I'll call these back-of-the-envelope calculations just to show you that there's enough resource, resource out there which is reachable, if you want to call it that, to power a significant fraction of our uh, electric power needs. And this has led some people to say, well, there's no reason why you can't be 50 percent uh, renewables or 50 percent wind by 2020, 2030. There are all sorts of reasons why you can't do that from a, just a resource implementation point of view. But the resource base is out there. The bottom line says here that we could, we could reasonably expect to get 50% of our current energy electric power usage from wind, and we could get 100% of our electric power usage from the sun without too much difficulty if you could build it all out and if it all was economically attractive. Now, those are a couple of big ifs, and let's look at those ifs in a little bit more detail. When we went through the renewables, we did it in the following sequence. We said, how much reserve is there out there? What's the state of technology? What does the economics look like? What are the impacts of large-scale introduction of wind and solar and what have you? And then what issues from a deployment point of view need to be addressed? So we looked at it sort of sequentially. Start with the resource and end up with what you might be able to install. So the resource base is there. Is it worth working at, working on? Yes. How much can you uh, harness? Stay tuned. This simply summarizes what I mentioned about the fact that there's a significant resource in both wind and solar. You know, I, I haven't mentioned biomass, and I know I'm in Iowa, and I, let me digress for a second here. I mentioned that up to 2% of uh, our electric power in this country comes from biomass. But we sat down when doing America's energy future, the people who were doing the re renewables, myself, people doing the alternate fuels technology, and the people doing fossil fuels. We talked about biomass. And we considered that biomass, number one, should be focused on biofuels as a substitute for oil. That was the primary use for biomass biofuels because there are alternatives that can be used in electric power generation. There's not too much of an alternative to the use of oil or an oil-derived product unless you were to use electricity. There are still going to be uses of biomass in power generation as supplement in coal-fired power plants, uh, the combustion of municipal solid waste, as you do here in the local power plant, uh, the use of landfill gas to drive gas turbines, and the existing pulp and paper industry, which converts waste material into electricity. So there will be uses for biomass to produce electricity. But in terms of a concerted program to grow bio, biomass materials and convert them into something that's usable, the major emphasis should be on biofuels. And that was a conclusion we came to. From technology point of view, uh, on the top chart, we're looking at wind uh, as a function of time in the various parts of the United States. And by and large, there have been ups and downs in, in terms of uh, wind capacity factors. But there's a general trend to improvement. Let me tell you that when I signed the first contract for wind power, these were 60 kilowatt machines. 
sort of the types of machines you would see out in the, in the farm belt of the United States. Today, we're building one and a half, two, two and a half megawatt machines. These are considerably larger machines than was done. Now, this has occurred over a period of time. There have been several generations going from 60 kilowatts to about 150 kilowatts to about 250 to 500 to 1 megawatt, 1.2 megawatts, 1.5 megawatts, 2 megawatts. There's even a design for a 5 megawatt wind turbine. So wind technology has moved forward. It gets you further up above the ground where the wind speeds are actually greater at, at say, 80 meters in the air rather than 20 meters in the air. Uh, the turbine blades themselves are more sophisticated and able to cap capture the wind resource over a wider range of wind velocities. So wind has improved considerably. In terms of solar in the lower chart, solar has improved also. Now photovoltaics tend to follow Moore's law in terms of price and, and over time. By and large, the price in the, of photovoltaics has been driven by crystalline, uh, crystalline silicon, which is the upper part of the curve. The question is what technologies or what materials will be used in the future, whether you'd be using thin films or new technologies. And there's a whole series of new technologies out there looking at uh, more exotic materials being used in the production of photovoltaics. It's clear that photovoltaic costs will continue to come down. <coughs> the other big area that will help in terms of renewables are storage technologies. On here is a whole slew of technologies, different technologies, and the two axes deal with the uh, time that the equipment would operate versus the power ratings of the equipment. And you can see, if you're talking large amounts of storage, the two that are out there are pumped hydro and compressed air storage. And these are the two that are out, out there today. Now, there is some introduction of batteries at the 10 megawatt level on a, a couple of systems in the United States. And so batteries are beginning to inch their way over the 10 megawatt line and will actually uh, come out there. Because the only thing the, that you need for 100 megawatts of batteries are 10, 10 megawatt battery packs, so to speak. Now, batteries for electric power system storage and batteries for automobiles are two different animals. For the battery for your automobile, you need to look at energy density and the weight that's involved and the space, that the volume that's involved. For utility use, you're not really restrained by that. You've got acreage and acreage. You can put out large, large <laughs> facilities. So. The drivers for on-vehicle battery storage and electric utility storage uh, are diverging. A lead acid, of course, is the, is the staple that's sitting out there, and you see the wide range for lead acid. But going forward, there's no reason why lead acid has to lead the parade in terms of utility storage. The key R&D areas in terms of uh, Renewable technologies are listed here, biosciences, liquid fuels from renewable sources, that would go to the alternate fuels people, advanced biomass, that is production of biomass, you know, do you, can you use marginal lands, how much water will it take to produce the biomass, things of that sort. Photovoltaics, materials and manufacturing, we spoke about that a little bit, large scale storage and geoengineering for geothermal and enhanced geothermal, and also compressed air storage. Technology finding is, again, there's no barrier to the introduction of certain of the technologies, principally wind and solar, as well as hydroelectric, some geothermal, and biomass today. There are no technological barriers. Cost may still be a factor, and incentives may be, may be are required to bring these technologies to bear, but there's no technological barriers to their introduction. And uh, they're, they're ready for introduction and can make an important contribution by 2020. On the economics, there are tons and tons of economic forecasts in terms of 2010, 2020, and going out even beyond that, 2030, et cetera, for each of these technologies. I'm simply listing here some of the examples and the sources they came from.
Some people are more optimistic that the prices can be driven down. Uh, others are less optimistic. And it's a question of how far and how fast technological developments occur. But the point is, if you look at these charts, uh, biomass comes in at around 10 cents, 9 to 10 cents. Wind can be anywhere from, well, we'll see it a little bit later, from 4 to about 10 cents. Let me skip photovoltaic for a second. Solar thermal, that's where you use concentrated solar energy to run a steam engine or a power cycle of some sort. You see there, there are at least uh, some people are thinking there may be substantial improvements in uh, the costing there. Photovoltaics remains fairly high, and that's at the 25 to 35 cent level. But the important thing on photovoltaics is they don't compete with the other forms of generation. <coughs> photovoltaics, by and large, are installed at the point of use, on the residence or on the industrial business. Therefore, their value is what would be closer to what would be the retail price for electricity rather than the wholesale price for electricity coming out of a power plant. So 25 cents is not that far away from some of the retail prices that are available in the United States at this time. This chart shows a little bit of where wind has come over the last uh, 20 some odd years. And you can see the price of wind has been dropping dramatically and the effect of having a production tax credit, that's what PTC stands for, you can see that make, can make a substantial improvement in the price of wind. Comparing that with the operating costs of natural gas combined cycles, you can see that since roughly since about 2000, wind, at least uh, in high wind regimes, is an economically attractive and, and competitive with uh, natural gas fired generation. Now, I have to put an asterisk on that because that's wind relatively close to the load center. If I put the wind at a distance from the load center, then I need to look at the added transmission costs and the intermittent nature of the wind as being a cost burden on wind at that point in time. This is a chart which summarizes uh, where the, the uh, renewables are relative to some of the base load options. Uh, we've got all the natural gas, NGCC is natural gas combined cycle, uh, CCS stands for carbon capture and sequestration, and you can see where coal with and without it is, where natural gas combined cycles with and without it is, as well as other base load such as biomass, geothermal, and nuclear. And then on the bottom we have the intermittent renewables, wind and solar. And if you look at this, you can see that at least from a range point of view, the renewables have the opportunity to be competitive with the base load technologies. And this is an exciting factor. Again, as I mentioned about solar photovoltaic, it's sitting out there pretty high, but it doesn't have to compete on a one-to-one -one basis with the base load operations. So the economics is, yeah, they tend to be somewhat more costly, but uh, there are cases where hydro and wind and geothermal in some cases that are economically attractive. It's certainly true that if the production tax credits there or if the renewable portfolio standards or a feed-in tariff are there, this will help drive the introduction of wind and, so and solar into the electric power systems of this country. And this one got a little bit of a added line to it. But anyway, in any event, if you can see this, what we're looking at now are the environmental impacts of the uh, renewable technologies vis-a-vis -vis the base load technologies. And as you can see, uh, the renewable technologies, including biomass, tend to be considerably lower than the more conventional resources. I might point out that I have a disagreement with the storage technologies listed on the extreme right-hand side because they don't take into, effect, into account the fact that when you put energy into storage and take it back out, you don't get a one-for-one -one round trip. You may get 75% on a round trip, 80% on a round trip. So the maximum should be higher because you do have an efficiency loss by going into storage and coming back out. The exploded chart in the upper right-hand corner does a closer look 
makes it takes a closer look at um, the renewable technologies. Now, the solar is listed as being quite high, and that is actually uh, photovoltaic. The, quest, the point here with photovoltaics is there's a lot of energy consumption that takes place in the production of silicon wafers and the production of the solar cells itself. So there's a high debt to society, if you want to call it that, that photovoltaics has to pay because of the, power, the production of the, the power required to produce the photocells. Land use. Land use is always brought up as an issue in terms of renewables. But it isn't as bad uh, as it might seem. It shows that hydro has got a, a, a reasonably high land use because you have to have a catchment area to a watershed area and reservoirs to be able to accomplish the collection of the water for a hydro unit. Wind is, again, relatively high, but again, if you look at a wind farm, it only uses up 2 to 5 percent of the land it's on, and the rest of the land can be used for secondary use, whether that's crops or grazing land and things of that sort. So its impact it can be minimized in terms of land use is concerned. Biomass, of course, is very high because you need to use the land for that particular purpose. And so the, the age-old debate of whether land arable land or land that's currently being used for food production should be used for biomass or should you use uh, uh, less desirable land for biomass. And that's where the emphasis of the research needs to be done to be able to look at less water consumption and less desirable land for biomass production. The main thing is by and large, renewable energy technologies are low carbon emitters. So if you're going to talk about a, a carbon, re reduced carbon future or a carbon free future, you've got, to bring you've got to bring your renewable technologies into play. And the more you can bring them into play, the better off you'll be. That's also true, believe it or not, for nuclear. Uh, it's less true for uh, coal and natural gas because you've got to develop a highly efficient carbon capture and sequestration technologies. Now, when, when we turn to deployment, the question is, how far and how fast can you go with deployment? This is a chart. It's a busy chart, but it simply looks at the resources that are required to build wind turbines and to install them. If the entire globe starts building wind machines, and that's been happening in Europe, it's happening in this country, it's increasingly happening in China, there's a heavy demand on particular materials that are used in wind turbine construction. So you've got to look for uh, lower source, cheaper sources of materials or alternate materials, composite materials, for example, for components in the wind turbines to bring down the price and not drive the price up. Say, this shows that uh, there has been a slight increase in the last couple of years in the cost of power produced by uh, wind simply be due, due to the fact that the project costs have gone up uh, in the last couple of years because of the high demand for materials. Another factor which is uh, important in the deployment area is what incentives are in place to bring about the uh, more, readily more readily introduction of renewable technologies. This is a chart which shows the effect of delays or early uh, re-upping, you know, reintroduction of production tax credits. There was a five-month lapse between 99 and 2000, and you can see the amount of installed wind dropped off dramatically. Same thing occurred in 2001 to 2002, in 2003 to 2004. In the last five years, this has been improved somewhat, particularly in the last few years because they've extended the production tax credits to the year 2012. Given the fact that the, the tax credits are going to be there, commitments have been made on the part of uh, wind manufacturers and wind developers to a much larger uh, deployment of wind. I don't know, this is an older chart and I've added up there in the upper right hand corner what happened in 2008 and 2009. 2008, 
even with the drop off in uh, the economy, 8.4 gigawatts of wind turbines were installed in the United States. 8.4 is off the chart uh, on this graph because it only goes up to 7. Now, you would think that 2009 it would drop off even more so, but because of stimulus funds going out for wind, being used for wind turbine purchases, et cetera, in 2009 there were actually 9.9 .9 gigawatts installed. So the total the amount of installation of wind in 2009 actually went up from 2008. Now, there's a, f there's a footnote on that. The manufacturer manufacturing of wind turbines actually dropped slightly because the stimulus money didn't go to the necessarily all the way through the system. It didn't trickle all the way down. So the stimulus money helped the installation of wind turbines more than it did the manufacture of wind turbines. But in point of fact, I think it's rather dramatic that in 2008 and 2009, we set consecutive year uh, records in terms of t uh, wind being installed in the United States. There's another uh, situation you have to consider in deployment, especially for wind. I'm a lot of focus here on wind because it's the technology which is getting the biggest play in nationally in terms of renewable technologies. You'd like to pick off the lower hanging fruit. And if you remember that chart on the resources, they talk about wind, uh, wind regimes from uh, class seven down to class three. You can see that if you've got the higher class wind regimes, the cost is going to be lower because you've got better wind resource, a wider range over which you can actually extract energy from the wind. Onshore, that begins to dribble down when you get towards class four and class three and the price goes up accordingly. Then you've, then you've got the question of can you go offshore? You can go offshore and you've got good resources offshore, but I've got added costs offshore because I've got to gather that energy up I've got to bring it onshore with cables. You're not going to put in overhead lines for offshore wind. And then, then hook it into the transmission system. So there are inherently higher costs associated with offshore wind than there are with onshore wind. A similar situation in terms of price and uh, uh, availability occurs with photovoltaics. Well, again, with the larger and larger production of photo cells, an introduction of those into utility systems. The demand has driven the price up, so the average module price in the last few years has gone up. Now, there's been a softening of that because of the economic situation. Uh, I visited some um, manufacturing facilities in China, and they're ready to build out their ma manufacturing facilities for photocells so that each of their facilities could produce one gigawatt of photovoltaic cells per year, but the, the demand has slackened because of the economic situation. And so if we were to plot this now for 2008 and 2009, we'd see a drop off. The important thing is the thin film, which is a small fraction, but a small but growing fraction, actually is the technology of the future because it has some inherent advantages over the crystalline photovoltaics. From a deployment point of view, when you're dealing with bringing technologies like wind and solar onto your utility system, there are a whole series of factors you have to consider. Cost, obviously, is number one, and supply of materials, as we were talking about. The inertia, you've got to, you're trying to build an industry, you're trying to grow an industry and, and it's, it's difficult to grow it because I'm not going to invest in a new manufacturing facility unless I see a demand that's going to be sustainable over a few years period of time because I've got to write off the investment in that plant. So there's an inertia that needs to be overcome. Having a production tax credit existing for five years or more helps that overcome that inertia. Risk and performance uncertainty. Uh, we're putting a lot of wind machines in. What if, there's a, what if there's a generic flaw in the wind turbines? And you have, actually we have a manufacturer out of India that has had that problem with uh, hubs and rotors. I'm getting a, could you maybe get a little bit of water? Uh, inadequate workforce. You need technicians that are trained in these particular areas. <coughs> 
complex decision making and policy setting, infrastructure limitations. You know, these are the usual things you find in any industry that when you want to grow. In this particular case, where we see it in spades, because we're going, to, we're going to try and ask this industry to grow rather dramatically. Thank you. We took a look now at a scenario. That is, what would it take to be able to get the installed wind capacity to be 20% by the year 2030? And the vertical bars represent the number of wind turbines or not number, but the gigawatts of wind turbines that would have to be installed on an annual basis to get there. You can see it's rather dramatic. Now, will manufacturers uh, make the commitment to be able to manufacture that number of wind turbines? It's a question of how the policies are written and whether or not there's, a, there's the will to keep the policies in place for extended periods of time. But what is shown here is a very real uh, a good scenario that was done by DOE looking at what the possibility was, would require to reach 20% wind by 2030. I'll let you look at the numbers here, and it shows you how, what's required. And what's required is a staggering number of wind turbines, 100,000, uh, $100 billion of a capital. You need to create 140,000 jobs, so you need to train 140,000 people to be able to accomplish this. But you will reduce 800 million metric tons of CO2 <coughs> annually, would be eliminated. You'd use 50,000 square kilometers of land area, 2 to 5 percent of which is directly needed for the turbines. We came to the conclusion that this is doable. <laughs> This is doable, but it requires that there be policies put in place which allow this to be done, and the sustainable policies. Now, I mentioned a production tax credit. Actually, the thing that's worked the best for uh, renewable development in this country has not been a production tax credit. It's been the renewable portfolio standard, which have been introduced in over 30 states in the United States. Renewable portfolio standard says, you want to, you want to build a 500 megawatt uh, combined cycle plant burning natural gas, fine. Uh, our renewable portfolio standard is 20%. So if you put in a 500 megawatt uh, natural gas fired combined cycle plant, you've got to put in 100 megawatts of renewable energy, 20%. So your project economics are based on 600 megawatts, 500 megawatts of combined cycle plant and 100 megawatts of wind or solar or whatever it might be. And the renewable portfolio standard has done more to drive the introduction, the more rapid introduction of wind and solar in the United States and in the Southwest geothermal too. So this is, this is doable. So we said, we thought that the, uh, on average, we could get to 20% renewables by the year 2020 and we could get to 30% renewables uh, or 20 percent non-hydro by t or more by 2035. And then this follows the types of scenarios I showed you for wind and then similar scenarios that look, for, look to the, the so introduction of solar. Now solar, there's sort of the competition. Are you going to build utility scale or are you going to build in individual residential photovoltaic systems? What we see coming online, or at least in the planning stages in California and the American Southwest, are a mix of both photovoltaics and central receiver solar, concentrating solar power plants. Uh, Southern California Edison has a program to build out 500 megawatts of photovoltaics on the rooftops of industrial buildings in the Los Angeles area. And these are flat roof uh, warehouses and storage buildings and things of that sort. The roof space on a typical warehouse in Southern California will put in a megawatt. It's a megawatt being fed directly into the distribution system, so its value is much higher than the generation price of, uh, of say, nuclear or coal. And they're on their way. They've got about five megawatts installed, and they've got permission to move out. Whoops, didn't move forward. There we go. This is what the build-out would look like in terms of the current amount of renewables. 
what would be added by uh, 2020 and what would be added by 2035. So it would be up to the point of uh, roughly taking what we have today and then they add it on. You'd be at the point of 30% uh, total renewables by 2035. And this more or less talks about the, the need for what I mentioned, the 21st century paradigm. The adequately bring the renewables into a modern system and run them and not have them be a detriment to the day-to-day -day operation requires that you bring in modern transmission and distribution systems into play, the so-called smart grid or intelligent grid, smart meters, things of that sort. This will allow us to react rapidly to changing conditions in terms of wind or solar availability and bring other resources online. You can build probably on a given utility system somewhere between 10 and 20 percent renewables in without being too concerned about the need for storage. But if you go above that, again, depending upon the system, storage becomes important because you have too much of an of inertia problem to overcome if you don't have that storage in there. The question becomes, do I need 12 hours of storage or do I need a half an hour or an hour's worth of storage? The reason I mention the smaller numbers is if I can bring up other thermal power plants online that have been at on so, sort of spinning reserve and bring them up to power while the wind is dropping off, maybe a half an hour's worth of storage would be all that I need to be able to allow other resources to come up. But this is a function of the particular utility system, and it needs to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. And this is what the utility system of the future would look like. On here are all the things you see to, you'd find out there today, such as the, the coal plant with the red roof at the top, the nuclear plant, etc., the substation and the residential ho the houses and the industries. All the things with black labels are the new types of technology that would be introduced to the utility uh, transmission and distribution system of the future, including uh, storage, high voltage DC transmission, advanced sensors and communication, outage detection, smart meters, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of technology, there's a lot of, there's a lot of words going on around today about smart meters smart grids, things of that sort. Let me just say that the important thing here is to pick the lowest hanging fruit which will pay the way for the rest of the smart grid to be put out. It turns out that it's an expensive proposition. So if you don't pick the right things first, you're going to be putting a cost burden on the individual rate payer. If you do the right things first, it'll be a cost savings to the rate payer and that's a way to finance the rest of the smart grid as we say in the trade, trust me. Uh, I think we've basically talked about these sustained actions that are essential. I think the bottom line is what I've got in red on the very bottom. Renewables offer the significant potential for low carbon generation of electricity from domestic sources of energy, which is a key, that are much less vulnerable to fuel cost increases because by and large they're independent of fuel costs. So it's an important rela relationship that needs to be done. In conclusion, going back to America's energy future and the whole enchilada, the key research and development areas are the ones I mentioned before with a few additional ones put in here which apply to other technologies dealing with uh, nuclear and so on and so forth and carbon capture and sequestration. The barriers to accelerated deployment are very similar for the broad range of technologies of America's energy future as I showed you for renewables. Renewables perhaps has a little bit different set simply because of their intermittency and people being scared of them, so to speak. There's a lot of laws that have been proposed. Uh, they've all been backburnered because of health care and jobs and the economy and things of that sort which has occupied Congress, but there are bills out there that could uh, strongly affect how we move forward in terms of America's energy future. Now, what's the outlook for 2010? 
There can be optimistic and I can be pessimistic. The optimism is because the public awareness remains high and it's a high priority of the current administration, both from the Secretary of Energy right up through the President, extremely high. I might add that Secretary Chu, the Secretary of Energy, was a member of the Committee on America's Energy Future. He resigned on January 20th, 2009. We have not had to pre present America's Energy Future to him. He knew what was in it to begin with. And I, I, again, security, economy, and environment are linked together, and they're all coming forward at the same time, which is important. And finally, there are causes for pessimism. Why? We're dealing with Washington folks. <laughs> Economic concerns remain overwhelming. The scale of the energy challenge is enormous. Will they, you know, it's like the elephant in the dark room. You try to describe it. If you're touching the elephant, it depends what part of the elephant you're touching because you can't see the whole animal. And it's easy to underestimate costs and complexity of transformational change, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a paradigm shift for the 21st century. With that, I'm going to take a drink of water, and I'll take some questions. That, that remains to be, that last point remains to be seen. The reason I like it is it's a lower cost, it's less silicon involved, it's a lower cost material. And what, what's happening is as, you, as we've increased the production of uh, crystalline silicon, the demand for that has gone up considerably and the availability has gone down. That's what's driven the prices up in the last few years. So I think it's important that we look for lower cost material materials that have the potential for lower cost in the long term. And, and amorphous silicon does have that. Okay. Uh, uh, the 300 uh, uh, gigawatts of wind that uh, the 2008 DOE study suggested, uh, I understand the issue of, uh, of uh, frequency regulation and being able to handle uh, uh, intermittency and so forth, but let's just assume we solve that. With cost of wind being what it is relative to the other alternatives and zero, practically zero emissions, shouldn't we be doing 600 giga, uh, gigawatts of wind instead of 300 in, in the next 30 years? That's, a, that's obviously something that could be considered. What we were looking, what we were looking for was what number could you do which would make sense that you might find the GE and the Siemens and the other turbine manufacturers agreeing to because it's an it's a extremely high uh, requirement in terms of manufacturing and new production that would be out there. We'd love to see more than that, but uh, again, it was... This was a consensus report. It's not just my opinion. We had wind advocates who thought that that was a reasonable number. I mean, people who were in the manufacturing uh, <coughs> business and the deployment business. So I'd like to see more than 20%, but that's tw not 20% installed capacity. That's 20% of electric power, which would be like 40% or more of installed capacity because of the intermittency of wind. So it's a large number of uh, turbines. Time for lemonade. Another question. I, I saw an article that Ames City Council, I think it was, was it this week, decided not to buy any more wind power. It seemed that like they felt it wasn't as cost effective as coal or something. Uh, is, is that true? Uh, I didn't read the Ames paper. <laughs> I, I don't know. Is, well, more, more, is wind more expensive than coal? It could be. If you, if you notice that chart, the, uh, uh, where I had all the uh, prices listed, uh, 
Coal without carbon capture and sequestration is quite attractive <clears throat> from a price point of view. So I can't argue that point. But if you put a value on carbon, as soon as you put a value on carbon, coal is going to go south. And so, you know, the decision you might make today based upon, I wouldn't sign a long-term contract to pay the price of the coal regardless of, of what the price would be because if carbon capture and sequestration or if carbon, if there's a price of carbon, whether it's cap and trade or, or carbon tax or whatever the, the form, it, form it might take, the price of coal is going to go up. Lemonade time. Um, do you feel that there's enough private incentive to do these types of uh, renovations to our energy system, or do you think it's going to have to be government-driven as far as providing the the money for which technology? Um, all of it. I mean, it sounds like there's a big increase in manufacturing and everything. Actually, what we, what we see for wind and solar is if you have production tax credits, if you want to say that's government subsidy or government finance, that's not quite the case. If, actually, if you look at just about any of the technologies we're talking about, there's some form of government subsidy or support in there in one shape, manner, or form. And what we try to do with this is strip out all the subsidies and all the hidden benefits that were there and say, what's the cost of the technologies? Then if you put a production tax credit on it, it'll drive it down. So, that, so for example, the, the cost bars for wind and solar, et cetera, are based upon the actual costs, the actual prices you would have to pay to, to install the technology. If you put a production tax credit on it, it'll drive it down. So that one chart, the horizontal bars, is independent of any sort of subsidy on any technology. <laughs>